Hey folks, here we are with the next installment of a new way to sew box pleated quilts. And again, I'm trying to devise these new ways because I never learned the old way. My um, my early instructors, uh, or my first um, my first master in the 70s, um, wanted nothing to do with them. It, the subject never came up. <clears throat> So I know the way I'm, I'm sure the way I'm doing it isn't remotely like the way that the Eldians did it, but it works for me. And as I continue to evolve methods, it'll work for me better. We'll see how that goes. So what I've done from our last, um, from our last video, do you remember I basted most of the pleats, all but one of the pleats, because the first and the last pleat will be knife pleats because the cloth is going to want to turn itself back into a knife pleat anyway. So I just had it off of the pass, so to speak. So what I've done, yeah, so it basted them all, pressed them all. And generally I don't bother doing this when I'm pressing a kilt, because I generally I don't press a kilt until it's, it's just about done. <clears throat> it's all but done. But in this case, I used a clapper. The clapper is a, in this case, a thick piece of Western red cedar. It may look a bit marked up, but it is actually very clean, except for the pencil marks. You can see this was destined to be a kayak paddle. And then I decided I needed a clapper more than I needed another paddle. But in any case, having ironed it, one puts, having ironed it, one puts the clapper on it and holds it down for 10 seconds or so. And that draws the heat and a lot of the moisture out of the cloth. Um, still not dry enough to work on, but I just kept doing that, pressing, and then uh, with every with every press, I would alternate side and switch end for end. <clears throat> I still had to let it sit overnight because having pressed one side, I flipped it over and pressed the second side because once again, even though it's just three you know, a, one single fold, so three layers of cloth, the, um, the crease on the other side wasn't, wasn't all it was, was to be desired. So press both sides. So I've just looked over it. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 pleats. So, yeah, so the uh, what remains to be seen is can I now rip this to its finished height without pulling my bastes apart? Now I'm just going to grab the camera and show you. Just for a close-up here, because once again, of course, I don't have my uh, my cameraman because it's still before dawn. So you can see what we've got here, basted to the end. This is the bottom of the fell at the yellow line. Okay, part two. The um, I must have touched something with my little finger when I was putting the phone back, because it all of a sudden, well, that video ended early. So here we are. I was. Um, I ripped the top band off with success. And again, this isn't largely due to the credit, entirely due to the credit of the excellence of Dalgleish cloth. <clears throat> because over an eight yard rip, I don't have a single yarn puckering the cloth. The, uh, the thread count is that good. The cloth is that good. So yeah, so the so far so good. This looks like this is uh, going to be successful. Touch wood. So I've pinned up the first pleat. <clears throat> Pardon me. And you'll remember from previous um, box pleats that if I basted the whole pleat and then sewed, if it sewed, sewed the fell, if the um, fold that I had manipulated with my fingers, sort of a cloth origami thing while basting it with the other hand, if the line wasn't straight, even as little as, in even a small amount as the width of one yarn, it would affect, it would adversely affect um, the clean run of, of 
the sewn portion of the fell. And it's the, um, particularly visible with very narrow pleats such as this, that even that space of a yarn would cause the line to wobble back and forth. And it, was, it wasn't a good look. Um, one other advantage that I see now, I'll be starting sewing in the usual manner, and that now that this isn't folded and pressed as a box here, is that I can sew the buttonhole in the same manner that I sew a buttonhole for a knife pleat kilt. Because if this was if this was a, a box pleat already basted and, and pressed as a box pleat, there would be a tiny fold under this portion, which I would then have to sew shut, because otherwise, <clears throat> it, it, if I didn't do so, in the completed kilt, the strap would come through the buttonhole and then bury itself in the tiny little fold right there. So it's just saved me a little bit of work. Okay, cool. I'm going to carry on with this. I might check in a little bit later when I've got some, put some pleats down range as it were. But um, so far this, um, this experimental new way of sewing, making box pleat kilts, I, I think I'm advancing. I think I'm making, um, I think this is a good idea. Cheers, bye. Here we are again. I've sort of fast forwarded myself, relatively speaking, and we're ready to sew the last pleat. Now, if you remember, we're experimenting with a new way to uh, sew box pleats, and that my method, at least, I baste one of the one of the creases and press it before I carry on. Because if I sewed the whole thing together and pressed it. Uh, press even pressing both sides the outside and the inside creases would be sharp but there's two inside there's sorry the front the, yeah the outside and the back side shall we say uh, creases would be pressed but the creases inside would not and that's not acceptable so if you remember I basted it all the way down or all the way up past a little bit about an inch above the bottom of the fell and then started sewing, but I discovered that, you know, it's working pretty well, but sewing a taper across a crease was really time consuming, really aggravating. <clears throat> so back about here, I decided I would unpick an inch or so, run my iron, a steam iron in, and press it flat down to the bottom of the fill. And then carry on from there and it, it was it worked a lot better it was a lot less aggravating so this is the, the last pleat which of course is a knife pleat because if i don't sew it as a knife pleat it's just going to become one anyway yeah so Oh, look, I forgot to do that. Let's put that chalk in. Yeah, this is how I'm going to do it for, for the future, or in the future, I should say. That is, unless I invent another way that works better. Okay, good. Nice, even taper. No drama there. Oh, my. Check to see what the old measuring tape says. Yeah, good. Okay. So I'm going to sew that. And then I'll tune it back on when I'm shaping the apron pleat. Uh, so it's shaping the inner apron. <clears throat> but from here, it pretty much continues as, as any other kilt, as a, a knife pleat kilt. Yeah. Although there will be one difference, of course, because this final, in an apron, uh, sorry, in a, in a knife pleated kilt, the last pleat is brought over to the line and the apron is brought up to the line. So we sort of have a box pleat effect inside. This side, this we, we will not because after this is sewn and the apron comes over to there, this is going to be the one pleat of all of them that is only a single layer of cloth. And that's going to influence um, how I sew the canvas in because I don't want stitches available from that outside. But we'll, we'll cross that obstacle when we reach it later on in this series. So 
yeah, I'm going to shut off the camera and keep working because I really don't think you need to see me sewing yet again. And we'll check in in a bit. Right, let's sew <clears throat> that inner apron into place. Now, I've laid out the the deep uh, pleat, the apron pleat, and it's exceptionally deep. It's more than halfway across the apron, but I'll explain why in a minute. <clears throat> because remember, when I sew this, this last pleat is only going to be a single thickness. And the other thing we're facing here is that every other pleat we've sewn, looking from right to left, the cloth is folded over and been sewn to a single thickness. And that's been ideal for my left handed starting at the top at the felt, bottom of the felt working to the top. But this pleat, or at least the, the apron, is the reverse, isn't it? Because we have folded over a piece of cloth on a single layer, but in the opposite direction. And I can't sew that neatly with my left hand. So if you're right handed, you're absolutely tailor made for that moment. But I'm just going to flip it around and I'm going to sew it starting at the top ending at the bottom of the fell and then having done that I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with that um, with that exceptionally dare I say um, unacceptably deep apron plate and this looks like rubbish right I get that but um, once the canvas is in and the top band is on I will baste this and in this case I'm probably going to baste it not just two but in one, two, three rows of basting from apron to apron, and then press it, and that'll, uh, it won't look awful after that. And there's a bit of shrinking to do up above in the, in the sewn portion of the fiddle as well. I don't know why my voice is so scratchy this morning. Okay, giving the, the wax a little extra friction there to get it well and truly into we'll get in there there we go this fine work is one of the I think it's probably the main reason why I haven't had laser eye surgery because being um, nearsighted is actually a bit of an advantage right now. Oh, I suppose I could get the surgery and then have reading glasses, but you know, whatever. Okay, let's. It's a bit weird to have a raw edge right there when I'm starting a seam. I'm going to overcast it a couple of times. One, two, and take a overcast the edge to protect the, uh, the yarns from getting loose. Three. Okay, let's get to work. An absolute filthy day out there. It's uh, another heavy rainstorm. <clears throat> no. <clears throat> Remembrance Day is the day after tomorrow, so I imagine that I'm not the only one with fingers crossed hoping that the rain will have ended before the 11th. Well, I've been out there on innumerable Remembrance Day parades pouring down rain and just sort of dealt with it by thinking that if my grandfather could put up with it for nearly five years in the trenches 1914 to 1918 that I could put up with it for an hour standing upright on a parade square but still it's uh, 
It's one of the things I, I least appreciate is slowly getting wet. I can handle wet and I can handle cold, but I don't like the two together. And again, sewing about, about eight stitches per inch. There's a St. Andrew's night in a few weeks, the 30th, Patriot Saint of Scotland. Although St. Andrew, of, he's lived his life in what I, I believe he lived his life in what is now modern Greece. I think was it Smyrna or something? I don't know. I could look it up. Wouldn't have been able to, in his lifetime, you or Scotland as such didn't exist. I think it was called Alba then, but he wouldn't have been able to point it on a, out on a map, even if he'd heard of it, because I believe the reason why they appointed him this patron saint was that he was crucified on an X-shaped cross. And of course, the saltire, that same X shape, has been part of Highland, the Highland Scottish, but also particularly Highland iconography since before the Pictish era. So, you know, at least a thousand years. So I'm pretty sure, I believe at least, that's why he was selected as the patron saint of a country he'd never heard of. But they have the St. Andrew's Ball. And I've been asked to provide <coughs> some narrow tartan strips for table runners. So what I've done is um, I've gone through my, my scrap box, you know, you, these small bits of cloth that are too small to do anything with, but too good to throw away. <clears throat> so they asked for me like, I don't know, a dozen strips of cloth, tartan cloth to, you know, to wrap um, uh, va flower vases in and to use as, as table strips. So I've, I've chosen the most esoteric tartans in the collection because I know that people will be sitting at the table playing guess that tartan and i challenge them they will have never seen this before because this is a, a recent design by the client so it's oh to be a fly on the wall when they're telling each other in perfect confidence what they believe it to be i'm slightly mean aren't i okay so Now remember, that's a single thickness, which could pose, pose us some problems. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do... There's our last pleat. There's the center. What I'm going to do is roll this over so that it's the same depth. There's another pin. Let me show you that again. Starting with that, I'm going to roll it over so that it's the same depth on the inside as the rest of those pleats. Ouch. I haven't done this for a while, so I'm going to have to think about this for a bit, because, yeah, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to baste this in place, but I'm not going to baste it just yet. In fact, let's first, let's just take a look at the inside of all the sewn pleats. Just looking for things that might leap out and haunt me later, you know? What's that? Let's 
all good. So that is our buttonhole, and our buttonhole is coming through there. So once again, I'm going to mark this so that I don't cut it. Uh, the steaking. Is going to be there. I am going to be cutting this. Where's my? I used to do this five inches. Now I do it six. The canvas is still going to be five inches wide, but by doing it, by cutting it, giving it an extra inch of depth, gives us more um, possibility, more potential should this kilt have to be radically shortened at some point in this future because I, I anticipate this kilt's going to last far longer than me because of course we can shorten the kilt by lowering the strap and buckle which raises the bottom of the kilt relative to the kneecap and we can lengthen a kilt by bringing the strap and buckle up but by giving that extra inch just gives us that little more potential and at no cost to ourselves so yeah so my steaking is going to be there i think i think i'm going to cut it let's say like that and there is an element of the design which you can't see there's a very faint brown line there which is i would say clearly visible to me but i'd be kind of lying it's visible but adding this white line, showing me where I'm cutting to, will remove a bit of anxiety. <laughs> Not all of it. This is Saturday. I anticipate having this kilt ready for him to... Okay, what I believe I'm going to do is I'm going to thin out, starting with this first pleat. I don't think I'm going to cut this one. I'm going to leave this uncut. But I'm going to cut these in the normal fashion. I'm going to steak in the normal fashion. And then when I get here, then I'll steak into this. And then I'll base this down. can't really explain why, what my thought processes are there, but uh, there's times <laughs> <coughs> over the years I have learned, if not to absolutely trust my hunches, at least to listen to them. So I'm not sure if this is, <coughs> pardon me, something new that's just come to me in this innovative flash, or if this is a half-remembered uh, procedure that I'd done in the distance past because I haven't made a, a box pleat kilt in at least a couple of years and maybe maybe yeah maybe this is an innovation I devised in the past or ultimately equally possible possibly perhaps more possible is this is somebody else's innovation that I remember seeing or at least I have seen in the past I don't have a conscious memory of seeing it in the past but perhaps I'm being influenced by somebody else, in which case, fair play to them. <clears throat> okay, now that I know what I'm doing, I'm actually going to pause now because, again, trusting the hunches, I'm just going to stop, flip the thing over again, and confirm my measurements to make sure that um, I am, in fact, not making some sort of horrendous mistake. I will just sort of in that right now okay got a bit of shrinking to do there just uh just because okay 
Okay, that's bang on. This is good. Pardon me. Okay, good. Let's move this thing up a bit. It can be here. cumbersome to have all of this cloth just sort of whipping all over the place. Now I'm going to unpin this and I'm going to move it out of the way so I don't make the critical mistake of actually cutting that. I already mentioned I don't intend to. So I'm going to um, stop the camera now and thin this out as you've seen me do in the past. I'll be frank, the reason why I'm stopping the camera is having the camera watching me while I do this is making me nervous. So, sorry. Play it out. Play the scene out in your head. <laughs> Talk to you later. Where's the dand off button? Okay, this is literally one of these, oh geez, you need to see this moments. And of course my videographer is busy. Um, do you remember when pleating to, when sewing to a knife pleat and putting in the steaking, we would stretch, really smooth it out so that it lay, so that we weren't um causing either the cloth to bunch or to stretch out but it's a little more complicated with this box pleat because we have this extra fold to consider so if i were to pull this taut i'd be smoothing this out and as a result the fall of the of the pleat would be at an angle and that's simply just not going to work out for us so what i'm doing is i pull the cloth so that it it, this part isn't bunched up, but then I'm bringing over that fold to the first pleat of the box pleat, or the hidden pleat of the box pleat, securing it with my finger, smoothing the cloth out from there, and then a back stitch. And then steaking a series of back stitches along, and of course, the thread is pulled off. Get back in there, you. There we are. Because with a box pleat, we're dealing with a few extra layers of cloth in there, aren't we? So it's pulled off a second time. So I'm just going to grab. Or splice in a new length of thread and frankly it's fortuitous that it happened at this moment because I need enough thread to to do that that, that uh, bellows pleat the the deep apron pleat that I'm going to turn into a, a bellows pleat okay Right, where was I? Three half inches. Good. my last pleat and you can see the basting's pulled away so this is flat I'm bringing this back to where it was smoothing it out with my fingers back stitch Gonna be a bit of a moment of truth when I finish the steaking and flip it over to see the other side. 
the outside, the side that's going to be visible when the kilt's being worn, to see if I've been successful or not. As you can see, there's some gathering in there. We're going to have to see how that behaves. So I remember we have that very deep, very, very deep apron pleat, but no, I'm going to bring it over. So that's the same. Yep, there's the other ones. Back stitch. Okay, there's the steaking done. <coughs> Pardon me. No. Let's Bases down. Where is my basting? There you are. My basting needle. No, do I start here and work? Yes. Actually, no. The steaking is a stable point to start from, so I'm gonna start there. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm just going to pause and see what the um, placement of the shot is because I may have to stop this and then change the focus. No, that looks that looks okay. I'll carry it on. Again, I swear the eye of these needles keeps getting smaller. <clears throat> I don't know why my voice is so hoarse today. stitch Another length.
see if we can get that out of there now. It's going to be a fairly open stitch because it's just... Oh. <coughs> Needle. There we go. All right, moment of truth time. Let's turn this over and see what we got. Now, as you can see, again, I'm a little unsure of the focus. There's the center of the inner apron. There is the apron pleat. Now, it's, it's not as deep as it was, right? It was past half. Now, it's a little more than a third. It's still very deep, but it doesn't matter because we've got that expansive cloth, the generous apron pleat, which, again, will make the kilt hang better, drape better when standing, it'll better movement when walking, a little more instant modesty when you sit down, and a, res and a, a reservoir should this ever have to be adjusted, altered to be bigger. Now there's a little shrinking to do when we iron it, but I think we're there. Okay, good. So from here I'm going to carry on, shape the end of the inner apron. Uh, and then get ready for canvassing. Awesome. From now, from here on, <clears throat> it pretty much proceeds exact. In fact, it proceeds exactly as for pressing a, um, or for making a um, knife pleat kilt. We shape the apron, we put in the canvas, canvases, the main and the front apron canvas. We baste it. We put on the top band. Actually, we based it. Uh, we call the fellow in for a fitting. We shape the outer apron and we carry on from there. Awesome.